I'm Merritt Horn, and welcome back as we continue our whirlwind tour of perspectives on studying the Urantia book. I'm going to pose a lot of questions in this video. I want you to stop often and think about them rather than watch it straight through, or at least watch it twice, once straight through, and once with a lot of breaks. Because if you don't spend at least a little time with the questions, the value of what we're doing together will be far less than it might be. One of the great benefits of recorded talks is that you can tell the speaker to be quiet for a few minutes until you're ready to move on, so make the most of that opportunity. Also, I'd like to remind you to take the time to respond to your classmates in this week's exercise discussions. A lively conversation is key to making this learning format work. And of course, remember that you are only reckoned in the super universes as having learned something when you demonstrate the willingness and ability to teach it to others. In the title for this class, I describe the Urantia book as a primary religious text, rather than as sacred book or scripture, just to make sure you'd view the video. I well know that no one who reads the Urantia book thinks of it as scripture or as a sacred text, and I suspect that if I titled this talk, The Urantia Book as Scripture, many of you would refuse to watch. Others would send me indignant emails about the very thought of such a thing and all of you would be inordinately suspicious before you even viewed the first frame. Well, now that you're safely here in the classroom, I'm going to make that connection, retitling this video as The Arantia Book as Scripture. Before you make a dash for the door, I'd like you to ask yourself a few questions. What constitutes the sacredness of sacred writings? What makes something scripture? If it has anything to do with the divinely inspired nature of the writings, how is the Arantia book not as sacred as any other? If it involves how such writings are religiously and morally authoritative for those who follow the teachings of the book, how is the Arantia book less sacred than any other? If it has to do with some idea of the infallibility and consistency of the writings, how is this different than the way some approach the Arantia book? I'm going to show you two dictionary definitions of sacred book. You'll note they're from old dictionaries, and I want to quickly tell you why I usually use reference works from the period leading up to the writing of the Arantia book. Such reference books, dictionaries, encyclopedias, and the like, are accurate reflections of the state of the language, of the culture, and even of human knowledge that existed when the Arantia book was written. By reflecting the cultural context of the time, they can give us an excellent sense not only of the status, but of the movement through time of language, culture, and knowledge. While it can be very helpful to look at modern dictionaries for some purposes, it's difficult to get a sense of what a word meant when the Arantia book was written without using a dictionary of the times. In this particular case, it's less critical to our work because I'm asking you to think about your own definition of sacred book, but it's still a worthwhile exercise and won't be inappropriate for this task. So, here are the two Webster's definitions related to sacred book. The Webster's Unabridged Dictionary from 1861 in its second definition of sacred says, proceeding from God and containing religious precepts, as the sacred books of the Old and New Testaments. The 1934 Webster's defines sacred book as any book, as the Bible or Quran, regarded by a religious body as an authoritative source or divinely inspired statement of its doctrine and law. Proceeding from God, regarded by religionists as an authoritative source or divinely inspired statement of doctrine and law. Do you think the Urantia book fits those definitions? If not, consider these statements by a divine counselor from the foreword in part one. Indicted by an Orvantan divine counselor, chief of the core of super universe personalities assigned to portray on Urantia the truth concerning the paradise deities and the universe of universes. I am commissioned to sponsor those papers portraying the nature and attributes of God because I represent the highest source of information available for such a purpose on any inhabited world. I portray the reality and truth of the Father's nature and attributes with unchallengeable authority. I know whereof I speak. If you take the Arantia book seriously, 
if you take the authors seriously. If you believe they are who they claim to be, how can you not view the Urantia book as a sacred book? Whatever our personal preferences may be, I'm going to use the concepts of primary religious text, sacred book, and scripture interchangeably in this class, and I'm going to apply them to the Urantia book. Without denying that throughout history, people have at times held very foolish notions about sacred books, or that many have abused their authority citing their interpretation of scripture to justify their abuses, I think the designation scripture can be very usefully and accurately applied to the Urantia book. There are several reasons for using the concept of scripture for this discussion of the Urantia book. One, the first reason is that scripture is a more compact idea than is primary religious text and is therefore much easier to manipulate as a concept. And two, this also helps us to put the Urantia book into a recognizable category for comparison and analysis. You see, there are a number of techniques one can use to analyze texts which are particularly appropriate to scriptural texts, or at least have been applied most thoroughly to such texts, and it may be helpful to use some of those techniques as we study the Urantia book. Though we won't actually get to any of those critical tools today. But more importantly, three, I really do think the Urantia book functions as scripture for Urantians, whether they would protest or not, and that description helps us to see clearly some facts about our relationship with a book and how that impacts personal religious experience, and four. Lastly, I can rely on the offended and confused emotional reaction you're having right now to loosen the arthritis in some of your conceptual joints. Remember, this is all about trying to use different frames of reference to gain a better understanding of what's really in front of you. You may certainly find that this perspective does not provide the opportunity for new insight and understanding, but then again, maybe you will discover something new. We're now going to briefly talk about two interrelated ideas. First, the four great questions which primary religious texts must answer, and then the 13 functions and attributes of scriptures that allow them to answer those questions thoroughly, effectively, and authoritatively. As we proceed, I want you to think about whether and how the Urantia book, the Bible, the Quran, and other primary texts answer the questions and perform the functions. I want you to decide for yourself whether or not what I'm describing as characteristics of sacred books are accurate as applied to the Bible in the experience of Christians or to the Urantia book in your own experience. As you think about it this way, does that match your previous self-understanding of your relationship to the book? Of your understanding of, for example, a Christian fundamentalist's relationship to the Bible? My goal through this meandering discussion is for you to think about your relationship to the Urantia book and the book's relationship to your personal religious experience. Does the Urantia book serve unintentionally as a crutch or even as a substitute for the kind of personal religious experience it extols? Do we ever substitute knowledge of things divine for direct experience of the divine? Remember, Please stop the video as often as you need to so you can think about each point. The lists of questions and functions aren't of much use if they just go by without taking the time to stop and think about them. Here then are the four great questions that religion and scripture must answer. 1. What exists? The great question about the nature of God and the universe. 2. Who am I and where am I going? our fundamental question about ourselves. Three, why does evil exist? Our moral question to God. Four, how should I live my life? Our moral question to ourselves. Does the Rancher book answer those questions for you? What do you think of the idea that the four parts of the book answer the four great questions? Let's see. The first part definitely describes the nature of God and the universe. Part 2 talks about the origins and immediate destiny of mortal beings in our local universe and has papers like The Inhabited Worlds and The Marantia-like Papers. Part 3 talks about the evolutionary process 
how it is and why it is that imperfection, hence the possibility of evil, exists in a universe ultimately created by a perfect God. And part four does indeed show us the, uh, how the ideal human life is lived. Could it be that something of the design and structure of the Urantia book is based on the need to answer those fundamental questions? Just some food for thought. Now, we're going to move from the four great questions to the nature of sacred writings. Here are what I would consider the 13 primary attributes and functions of scripture that allow it to meet the demands of the four questions. As we go through these, I want you to think about how they apply, or if they apply, to the way people think about the Bible, or Quran, or the Urantia book. Other than theological distinctions, which are many, are there any functional differences between the Urantia book and other scriptures? Are there any features or functions of the Urantia book that you think disqualify it from the category of sacred writings? I did try to come up with a shorter list, but it seemed to take this many to get the job done. So here we go then. The 13 attributes and functions of sacred writings as I see them. Scriptures, one, were written via some special relationship with God or other spiritual beings or forces. There was something about the process that distinguishes them from everything else. Something about their origins that makes them different from all other writings. They, too, have a unique status and unique authority by virtue of their origin. Because of this unusual and powerful origin, the writings are able to make claims upon us. We have to take them seriously. They cannot be ignored. Three, they carry within their tradition stories of the peculiar circumstances of the scripture's transmission from first writing to the present which is assured the genuineness and accuracy. There has to be some way we can know that what we have in front of us still reflects the original. 4. They reveal the nature and attributes of God and other spiritual beings and forces. Scripture must make plain the ultimate source of all things. 5. They describe the nature of the world and God's relationship to it. 6. They describe the nature of human beings and their relationship to God and to the world. 7. They define the true nature of good and evil, of righteousness and sin. 8. They reveal the responsibilities we have to God. 9. They disclose the responsibilities we have to each other. 10. They define salvation and reveal the way to salvation. 11. They are used as moral, ethical, and religious guides for living the righteous life. 12. They provide inspiration. They are a source of power to do the right thing. And 13. They can be successfully applied to the problems of daily living. Notice that these functions are independent of the particulars of theology. Regardless of the theology or philosophy that may be constructed from them, I would argue that primary religious texts will all have these functions and attributes. Scripture's ability to perform all of these functions causes religionists to conclude that there is nothing else comparable to the scripture they follow, that nothing else fits into the same class of texts. I know you feel that way about the Urantia book, and I know that's the way a devout Muslim feels about the Quran, and the committed Christian feels about the Bible. It isn't surprising the religionist believes that no other writings are in the same class, because no other writings perform all of these functions for that individual. And if the sacred writings of a tradition cease to serve these functions for someone, that religionist is at risk of falling away from that tradition. Given the serviceability of scripture, is it any wonder that a relationship with the book may sometimes seem to take the place of a relationship with God, that a revelation of God appears to become confused with the God who is revealed? I'm making these points because I think that most Urantians think that not only is the Urantia book superior in content to any other book, but that the Urantian's relationship to the Urantia book 
is inherently more mature than the relationship which others have with their scriptures. I'll grant the first view, but I'm not always so sure about the second opinion. It could just be me, but I do know that my relationship with this book, its amazingly inspirational and consistent message, has sometimes taken the place of a more mature personal religious experience with actual spiritual realities. I find that I can easily allow the authors to inspire me with their own personal religious experiences without taking the time to have that experience myself. Is experiencing religion secondhand from a Melchizedek really any different than experiencing it secondhand from the Apostle Paul? It's the secondhand nature of religion that's at issue here, not the relative excellence of the theology of the Melchizedek versus Paul. Of course I know better, but I still have a tendency to go down that path. It's so much easier. My goal, as I indicated earlier in this talk, is for us to think about our relationship to the book and the book's relationship to our personal religious experience. Does the Arantia book serve unintentionally as a crutch or even as a substitute for the kind of personal religious experience it extols? Might we ever substitute knowledge of things divine for direct experience of the divine? Is it possible that the revelators challenge not just Christianity but Urantian religion when they say this. The world needs more first-hand religion. Even Christianity, the best of the religions of the 20th century, is not only a religion about Jesus, but it is so largely one which men experience second-hand. They take their religion wholly as handed down by their accepted religious teachers. What an awakening the world would experience if it could only see Jesus as he really lived on earth and know firsthand his life-giving teachings. Descriptive words of things beautiful cannot thrill like the sight thereof. Neither can creedal words inspire men's souls like the experience of knowing the presence of God. But expectant faith will ever keep the hope door of man's soul open for the entrance of the eternal spiritual realities of the divine values of the worlds beyond. We cannot allow even the Arantia revelation to stand in the way of the mission laid down for us by the revelators. Christianity has indeed done a great service for this world, but what is now most needed is Jesus. The world needs to see Jesus living again on earth in the experience of spirit-born mortals who effectively reveal the Master to all men. Modern culture must become spiritually baptized with a new revelation of Jesus' life and illuminated with a new understanding of his gospel of eternal salvation. And when Jesus becomes thus lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. Jesus' disciples should be more than conquerors, even overflowing sources of inspiration and enhanced living to all men. Religion is only an exalted humanism until it is made divine by the discovery of the reality of the presence of God in personal experience. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this class and will find some benefit from it as you go about your daily life. Godspeed.